Praise God. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap if you can this morning. Hallelujah. Welcome to our YouTube friends and our ECF, our Facebook friends who are joining us right now in service. Praise God for another day to give him glory and to give him praise. Amen. Well, we've been in this series now going on seven weeks. This is our seventh week. us for this time of in, in, his, in his history in order to go into the vineyard where he's planted us to reap the harvest that he has already prepared for us. Amen. So in this series, we've already talked about the commission, how we have been commissioned by God. God saved us and he left us here for a purpose. Amen. If God didn't want us to use, be, use us to save folks or to use us to share his gospel, the moment he saved us, he would have took us home. Amen. But the reason he left us here and he commissioned us is because he commissioned us with a work that we might spread the good news of what he's done for us to somebody else. Amen. So we understand the commission. We also recognize we talked about the command. There is a command from God. It's not an option for a believer to share his faith. It's a command from God that you share your faith. We recognize because the command comes with a calling. And that's a calling that God has placed upon our lives. And that calling is motivated and moved by compassion and by conduct. And then last week we talked about consequences, not negative consequences. God says in the word that the laborer is well paid. Amen. We're talking about positive consequences, beneficial consequences, consequences that are beneficial, that are eternal, and that are mutual to anyone and everyone who will do what God commands them to do. And so today, in the last message in this series, we just want to talk about conversation. Amen? Not only just the conversation we have to tell others about Jesus, but the conversation we have with one another as we interact with each other. And the purpose of this conversation and what our motives behind these conversations ought to be. Amen? So if you will, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Philippians. And for our first scripture, and then in Colossians for our second scripture, we'll get started with this discussion today on the conversation. Amen. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, and then Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, and Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians 1, out of the King James Version of the Bible says, Only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And then in Colossians Chapter 4, verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each, each one. The Living Bible translates that let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you'll have the right response for everyone. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless your word in these moments. We desire to hear from you. So we pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you would speak. Speak now, for your servants are ready to hear. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The conversation, the conversation, the conversation, our conversation, our conversation with each other, our conversation about Christ. We want to talk about how we talk about Jesus, and how we talk to each other. <laughs> In the dictionary, the dictionary defines conversation this way. It says conversation is a talk, especially an informal one between two or more people in which news and ideas are exchanged. In other words, a conversation is an exchange of information. Amen? Wouldn't you agree? 
the conversation is an exchange of information. If I want to get to know something or you want to impart information to me, we have a conversation or I have a conversation with you to find out some things or for, for you to impart information to me. Speaking of the fact that it is an exchange of information, a woman went to a lawyer to say and said she wanted to get a divorce. And so the lawyer pulled out his notepad and began to take notes, and he began to ask her some questions. First question he asked her was this. He said, do you have any ground? And she said, oh, yes. We have about three quarters of an acre. <laughs> the lawyer paused for a minute and thought, what? So he asked her another question. He said, well, wait, wait, wait let me ask you this. Well, do you have, do you have a grudge? No, the woman replied, we don't have a, uh, no, 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 the woman replied, no, but we do have a lovely carport. <laughs> Lawyer Paul for a moment and thought, well, maybe, maybe, okay, so, okay, let me ask you this. Does he beat you up? No, I get up before him every morning, the woman said. <laughs> Finally, the lawyer said in frustration, he said, woman, lady, why do you want to divorce your husband? Because, she said, the man can't hold an intelligent conversation. <laughs> Depends on how you conversate and what you say in order to get what you, you want. Amen. Conversations become one-sided when the folks don't understand what you're talking about. Amen. Well, the goal of the Bible and, uh, it is to learn the conversations, and, or the goal of Bible study, rather, is to learn the conversations and commands that God gives us in order that we might communicate them in our conversation to others in a way that will cause them to respond to God the way he wants them to. And, uh, and, and listen, and, uh, and on the other hand, at the same time, we need to make sure that our personal conversations do not cause people to turn away from him because, as his representatives, our conversations should always, always, should always reflect his character. Last time you thought about your casual conversation reflecting the character of Christ. Because I find in the church sometimes we don't too much care, think much about our regular conversations. And then it's in those regular conversations where we probably have the greatest impact of drawing people to Christ or driving them away. You see, our conversations should always be redemptive. Are you with me today? Our conversation should always be, regardless of whether it's about the gospel specifically or in our daily conversations as we come in contact with those that we meet on a, on a daily basis, we should understand that our conversation and a motive of our conversation, as believers especially, that our conversation should be redemptive in motive. Now, whether I'm having a conversation with you about something that's going on in your life or I'm telling you specifically about the gospel, that my motivation behind my conversation is to help you either grow in your relationship with the Lord or come to know the Lord. Amen, like. And so, therefore, as we talk about this subject of conversation, I believe that our conversation should have basically two motives. Basically, two motives there should be in our conversation, which are taught in the passages that I've just read to you. Two basic motives, and listen, and, and, and in everything else that you talk, everything else that you deal with in conversation fall in these two categories. Are you with me today? Okay, so first motive in my conversation, according to the text that we just read, the first one in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, first of all, my conversations are to be engaging. Amen. The first motive of my conversation is that and yet the text says, only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ. And Paul goes on and says, so that whether I hear about you, whether I come and see you, whether I'm absent, I'll hear that you're standing firm in the spirit and that you're striving for the gospel of Christ. 
Paul's in prison and he writes these letters. Both of them are from his, his prison incarceration. And he's writing to the Philippian church and he's telling them about his exploits and the challenges that he's going through. But then he admonishes them about what their motive ought to be in terms of their conversation. Because he says in, in Philippians particularly that some of the folks think that their conversation is causing more problems for him than good. He said, because there's some of them out there preaching in order to cause me more harm and to, to make me feel jealous or to make me feel bad. But they don't understand. I don't care what the motive is. They preach in Christ. As long as they preach in Christ, that's good for me. He said, whether it's in bonds or whether I'm free, whether it's to make me feel bad or not, I'm glory in the fact that they preach in Christ. So the essence of the, of, of he's saying to them is that in your conversation, your conversation ought to be engaging. It ought to be such as engaging people to make a decision about who Jesus is in their lives. So therefore, I say that in, a, in an engaging conversation, you ought to consider the four seeds. In an engaging conversation, you ought to consider the four seeds. In an engaging conversation, if you're going to engage somebody about the gospel, there are four seeds you need to be conscious of. First of all, you want to engage them with an idea of confession. You want to get them to make, help you understand where they are in terms of their confession for Christ. Do Listen, do you know the Lord? That's the question you want to answer for. You want somebody to answer when you're talking to them about the gospel. Do you know the Lord. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 says, we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with a heart man believes unto righteousness. So my, my engaging conversation is going to get somebody to make a confession. Where is your confession? I need to know where you stand in terms of do you know the Lord? Because based on that confession tells me how my conversation progresses from that moment on. Amen. Now, it's an interesting word, the word confession. In the Greek, the word confession is the word homologia. Homologia, where we get, our, where we get the theological term hermeneutics from. Homologia literally means the speaking forth or the telling of something. And the basic meaning of the word homologia in the Greek, it means to acknowledge, it means to profess, it means to admit, it means to declare, it means to say plainly. So when you're asking somebody to, to confess something, you get, you're asking them to declare what they believe. When you're asking somebody to confess something, you ask them to say plainly what it is that they believe in and what they stand on. And listen, and as a believer in an engaging conversation, you can't really talk about the Lord until you know where somebody is when, in their relationship with the Lord. Amen. Because you need to know how you need to present him. If they know him, okay, then we can talk about him in a way that we know him and we can encourage one another. But if you don't know him, I need to tell you how you get to know him. So here's a confession. But the, 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 the root, the word homologia comes from a root word called homologia. Homologia is an important word because in, this, in the static dialogue, it indicates not only just what somebody finds in terms of confession, but the object of this word implies that followed by the confession is their appropriate response and action. So it's not only just something I say, but it's something that I say that is verified by what I do. Hmm? And, 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 and further on, the philosophy goes on and says it becomes something that is integrated in my life. So when I make a confession about something, when I'm getting ready and I want to encourage my, and I make a confession, I'm encouraging somebody about confession, I'm not just wanting you to tell me what you say with your mouth. I want you to tell me what you say with the mouth that I can see in your lifestyle. A confession implies not only just a verbal affirmation, but a life confirmation. Are you with me? Romans said you will confess with your mouth. That means not only am I confessing something that I believe in, I'm confessing something that I've appropriated and made a part of my life. And then he says, and believe in your heart. Pistos is the Greek word, which literally means to be persuaded or be convinced about. That I'm not only just got a belief up here, it's something I'm so persuaded and convinced about that I'm willing to tell you about every time I get a chance. When you're persuaded about something, you're convinced about something, you want somebody to know how persuaded you are. Amen? Everybody been to a good restaurant where you had a good food and you're persuaded that the food is good? Do you keep that to yourself? You, you want to tell your friends, your family, anybody you come and come, you know something, I just had a good meal at so-and-so restaurant. You need to go. I'm telling you, it's good. 
And listen, then you say, when you go, come back and tell me and confirm. Ain't it good? Because when you're persuaded about something and something that you believe that is good, you want folks that you love and care about to experience the same thing. Ain't Jesus been good to you? I just want to know that this morning. I I just want to know, has he been good? David said, taste and see. (laughs) I don't know about you. I done tasted him. He good. So homologia and belief go hand in hand. You, you can't confess without believing. You can't believe without confessing. And so in the engaging conversation, you want to get somebody to confess. But also in an engaging conversation, you want to also bring about conviction. Because the goal of my engagement is to find out where your convictions are. Not only just your confession, but your conviction. Have you given your, the Lord your life? You see, there's a lot of folk who say they love him and say they know him, but they haven't given him. They're like, we talked about this last week, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. He who hath the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. Listen, it, it, beyond confession comes the aspect of, of conviction. That I've, My confession leads to the point that my conviction shows that my lifestyle will reflect what I say. Are, are you with me today? Talking about an engaging conversation. So when I'm going to engage somebody over a conversation about the Lord, I'm going to find out where they are in terms of their belief in him. Then I'm going to find out where they are in terms of their conviction for him. See, because everybody talking about God don't believe in the same God you're talking about. Right. Oh, oh, yeah, you, you're in a world today, you got, we, we're in a plethora of a pantheon of gods in America. We got all kinds of gods. Even myself is a god. Come on now. Uh, yeah, and so the idea is that when everybody talks about, oh, I have belief in God, praise God, thank God, and you hear them talk on TV giving homage to God, you got to find, you got to ask yourself, what God are you talking about? Because if the God ain't reflected by your lifestyle, I wonder what God you following. Because a God I know requires something of your life. God I know requires a certain standard that you live by. God I know requ- requires that there's a level of integrity that you walk by according to his word. It based on conviction. So when I'm in engaging conversation with somebody and they start confessing to me that they know the Lord, then I move to the conviction part. I'll say, oh, you know the Lord? Okay, then. What about your life? What about the Lord it, it, that affects your life? Have you surrendered your life to him? Have you really given him wholeheartedly all of you, or is he a part of your life? (laughs) I know that's a terminology we adopted a long time ago, make Jesus a part of your life. But I had an old preacher tell me that Jesus didn't come to share crop you. He ain't ain't come to partner with you with your life. He come to take over your life. (laughs) So my conviction has to be such that I've surrendered my life. Does your life reflect the character of Christ? Does your life portray his morals and his characteristics and his values? That's how you know you've surrendered your life to him. That's where your conviction comes in beyond your confession. And then when your conviction is there, then you want to talk about consistency because the th- third C is that do you obey him? See, see, the conviction is I've surrendered my life and the conviction is I confess that I confronted my life. But then the issue is the consistency of my surrender and of my life because there are, are Christians who won't, won't, don't walk consistently. Do you obey the Lord? Because, you see, obedience is a challenge. Yes, it is. God intends for it to be. Yes, he does. Because because in aspect of obedience, it shapes you. It shapes your character. It shapes your morality. It shapes your priorities. It makes you not look for the approval of man and seek for the approval of God because nine times out of ten, obedience won't be pleasing to anybody else around you. (laughs) So when you choose to obey God, stop thinking it's going to be easy. That's why he gave you the Holy Ghost. That's why he gave you the anointing. 
That's why he gave you the power, because he know in your flesh it ain't easy. <laughs> but that's, the, that's, that's where I really find in this engaging conversation where I separate the sheep from the goat. When I'm in this engaging conversation, and I get down to this point of consistency, and I get down to talking to believers about do they obey the Lord. Oh, how the excuses come as to why I can't obey God now. Oh, the excuses come as to why I can't do what the Bible tells me as a believer I need to do. All oh, the excuses come. And how God needs to understand my circumstance and my situation and how he needs to give me a pass because I can't do what he wants me to do right now. The way his word tell me to do. You don't know my finance is just too tight. I can't tie. I can't tie. I want to, but I can't. Because if I did, my cable get cut off. If I, if I did, can't do my nails. If I did, can't get my hair done. If I did, can't, I have to cut off some of them cable shows. If I did, I, you know, I, I want to. God knows I do. No, you don't. You don't want to. Because you do what you want to. <laughs> you really do do what you want to. If you really want to do it, you don't care what it costs. You're going to do it. Because you want to. This is about consistency. And consistency is telling when it comes to the obedience of the word of God. Because true obedience works through the hard stuff because they know the hard stuff is where the blessings come from. And the last thing about this, this engaging conversation that is, is important to recognize is, 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 is that, no, no, let, let me know, let me go back up because I got a verse here that you need to look at. This is a good verse. Back to consistency. First John 5, 3 says this. It says, for this is the love of God, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. I mean, the Bible tells you God's commandments are not burdensome. Now, that's an interesting word in the original language. The word is barus in the Greek, and, and it literally means this weight heavy or weighty. God's word is not weighty. God's word is not heavy. God's word is not burdensome. Matter of fact, the, the word literally, figuratively means, denotes the importance of unavoidable circumstances or, or existence. Namely, that God's word is not oppressively suffering or, and, it's, and it is also significantly powerful. That word Baruch tells you that the reason God's word is not burdensome, God's word is not burdensome, one, because it does not put excessive pressure on you. And suffering on you, but at the same time, when you obey it, it gives you significant power. You see, we tend to want to think that obedience is burdensome. But I can't really do that. You don't know what I'm going to have to sacrifice, God, if I would do what you, that just seems like just excessive suffering, more burden than I can bear. Text says God's word's not burdensome. But we make it burdensome because we don't want to do what it says. So we come up with all kinds of reasons why it's just too much for me to bear right now to do what God tells me to do. God tells me to love even the unlovable. God, you just don't know what they do. You just don't know what they've done. You just don't know how they act. You just don't know how they treat me. Do you hear the way they talk to me, God? And you want me to love them anyway? You know how much they humiliate me? How they embarrass me? You know, I, I, every time I try to do something nice, they don't even recognize it. And you still want me to what? Your words that low. How can I, God? That's burdensome. That's more weighty than I can handle. 
How do I love them when they treat me so bad? How do I treat them nice when they won't treat me nice? How do I, how do I say good things about them when all they say about me is bad? Time I reach my hand out to help, they slap it away. God, how do I do that? How do I love them when no matter what I do, they don't need, they don't force you and Courtney, they don't even acknowledge it or accept it. And you still want me to love them, to speak positively about them with other people, to tell folks that I still in relationship with them even though they don't want to be in relationship with me? And in my heart, I, I, have to, I have to mean this from my heart. That's hard. That's bur he said, but the word is not burdensome. But said, love those who spite you, and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Bless and curse not. But the word ain't burdensome. But understand, understand that if I do it based on obedience, and I do it because it's what God requires, the opposite of burdensome, barus, is strength. The command of God will not cause, nor cause, or nor do bring uh, oppressive suffering. And it, it does mean hardship or constraint or did cause depression or comfort, but the commands of God provide significant strength. It says, commands of God provide significant strength. The Bible says the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to, be, even to divide between the spirit and soul, joint and marrow, and is a discoverer of thoughts and intents, that the word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That when I obey God's word, even, and I, even in the midst of what seems to be weighty and oppressive, when I do what God says, God then infuses me and endows me and empowers me with a significant ability and the power to be able to do what he's required of me because I choose to obey him. See, the power don't come apart from obedience. See, the reason why it's hard for you? Because you don't want to obey. But the moment you decide to obey, power comes. The moment you decide to do, the anointing and the power comes to give you the ability to do what God is requiring and what God commands. But you can't access that, access that power in disobedience. Because the more you resist, the harder it gets. Oh, yeah, that's the way it works because you ain't depending on God now. You're depending on you. And as long as you're going to deal with your resources and handle it your way and resort to your ability, God said, go ahead. Because basically what you tell God, I don't need your power for this. I ain't going to do what you say. <laughs> So God says, since you don't want to do what I say, then you don't need my power. See, we keep thinking this thing, we keep, we, we, the devil has deceived us in thinking this thing works backwards. See, we think that if we resist, then God give us power. God, you know I can't do this. I can't do that. You ain't saying you can't. You, I don't want to do this. Be honest. I don't want to do this. That's what you really say. I don't want to do this. So as long as you're telling God you don't want to do this, why should God give you power to do what you don't want to do? You keep thinking your word is what God is listening to when he's looking at your heart. Because you're saying with your mouth, Lord, help me do this. But your heart says, Lord, I don't want to do this. <laughs> so the consistency is, is important as we engage one another we need to engage each other and the issue of consistency the Bible says we ought to provoke one another 
to love and good works. Too often, too often, we wink at sin. We turn our backs on brothers and sisters who are falling and going astray. We don't, we don't assist. We don't come along. We don't hold their arms up. We just let them wallow and flout. And the Bible tells us we need to provoke them to love and good work. We need to come along somebody and pick them up and say, listen, listen, you need to get them to start acting right, and I'm going to walk with you till you do. But that's the engaging conversation that God tells us we need to have. But then the last thing, and the last thing, because i got to get to my second point, and I'm almost done. Um, the last is conquering. The third, the fourth she in the engaging conversation is conquering. Is there a change in your life? Not only do you know the Lord, not only have you given your life to the Lord, not only do you obey the Lord, but then the conquering conversation and the engaging is the conquering. See, we need to talk about has there, there's been a change in your life. See, we, we testify about what God has done for us and what God does for us and what God's doing and changing our life, and that's a good thing. But do we have the conversation to ask if, uh, one another on a consistent basis? What is God doing to change? What is God doing to change your life? What has God done to make you where you are and, what you, and believe what you believe? How has God changed your life? How has God transformed your life? How has God done what he's done? And you're like, listen, we need to have that conversation for one another with each other on a regular basis so we can continue to mo- promote each other's faith and encourage each other's confidence in what God is doing. The only time we talk about conquering conversations and have conquering conversations when we just feel like we're going to overcome something big. Then we want to stand in front of church and give testimony. But what, just what about that victory you just had the other day? That you didn't sip when you wanted to sip. Or you didn't smoke when you wanted to smoke. Or you didn't watch when you wanted to watch. You understand? It's those little victories. It's those victories day by day and moment by moment. That when you encourage each other in those things, it makes each other feel like, hey, I ain't the only one. But look at what God's doing for me and he's doing it for them too. Conquering conversation. We want to talk about the big stuff. And we don't ever hear what's going on with the little stuff which all of us are falling all over on. All of us are stumbling on. Lies and and, and issues of things that are coming in my life that I'm trying to get victory over. I feel embarrassed to tell the believer because ain't no other believer told me they struggle with lies, but I do. No believer told me they struggle with this temptation and but I do. And I, I don't hear or hear or talk to anybody that's talking about the victory that they're getting in those areas in their lives. In engaging conversation, part of authenticity is being real about where you come from and being real about where God has taken you and being real how God is lifting you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Come on now, that's, that's what it's about. Listen, listen, listen. We all face our doubts. We all face our fears. We all wonder sometimes what in the world God is doing. But some of us are scared to mention that in a mixed company of believers for fear we're going to get condemned because we ain't spiritual enough or we ain't strong enough or we ain't holy enough or we ain't righteous enough. And we don't need to open our mouth until we get it together. And that's the biggest problem with us. All of us falling all over ourselves because we're trying to get it together and ain't nobody holding my arms up to help me get it together because I can't confide in nobody. Conquering conversations and engaging require that I need to know what I'm being conquered over. What I'm getting victory over day by day and moment by moment. First motive in my conversation is that it would be engaging. Engage them with the gospel Find out where their confession is. Find out where their conviction is. Find out where their consistency is. Find out how they're conquering those things in their lives that everybody's stumbling over and falling over every day. How do you get over that stuff? Second motive. I got to move on. Second motive is found in the next text in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. First motive in my conversation is that it be engaging. The second motive in my conversation is that it would be encouraging. Colossians 4 says this. It says, 
let your speech always be with grace. Seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each other or each one. Engaging, encouraging conversation. See, in an encouraging conversation, what you ought to get out of an encouraging conversation is what I call the, the three C's. You've got four C's on the first one, there's three C's on the next one. And the three C's in this one are not so much about the gospel as they are about you and me. My, where we're coming from in terms of our heart and our relationship with the Lord. When I'm in an encouraging conversation, first thing you ought to get from me is you ought to feel my compassion. You ought to feel. When I'm engaging you and I'm in a conversation with you and we're not talking about the gospel, we're just talking about stuff, church, anything else that's going on, you ought to get from me in that conversation is my compassion that I have for you. What are you saying about first part of the text says, let your speech always be with grace. Charis is the Greek word, grace. It's the same grace that Jesus extends to us. The same word used for Jesus' grace is the same word that he uses here for grace. Grace, grace which, which basically means to show kindness to someone. Grace, which means to put the implication of being gracious or showing graciousness. And graciousness means courteous, kind, and patient on the part of the one showing such kindness. That, that God says that my speech should always be with kindness, graciousness, mercy, care. Wow. <laughs> wow. My conversation should show you how I feel about you. <laughs> All the time it does. My conversation will always let you know how I feel about you based on what you do to me. <laughs> now, whether that's compassionate or not is another thing. When it comes to talking to you, I'm going to talk to you the way you deal and I ain't worried about it being redemptive. Even though I call myself a believer, I ain't worried about whether it edifies you. And I really don't care. <laughs> if it communicates how I feel in terms of my liking of you or not. That is how most of us operate in our conversations when it's not engaging. Because we think we have freedom to talk the way we want to based on how people treat us. But if you read the text, it don't give you that freedom. It said, always. Yeah, always. No matter how they talk to you, 
No matter how they treat you, no matter how they act towards you, no matter whether they done what they said and did or didn't do what they said, if you who are in relationship with God want to honor him in your life and want to cause him to be glorified through you and to be pleased with what you do, your obedience then has to reflect not just in what you do, but how you talk. That's why a lot of folks come to church and leave. Because the way people talk to them. A lot of people get involved in ministry and quit. Because the way people talk to them. That's why most folks have a problem with church folk. <laughs> because the way they talk. And if we're on Bay text, and, and, and listen, I'm working on this text all week long. And I'm telling you, God just really, whoo, Lord, this is really something. You know, you, I don't think we talk much to each other about our conversations apart from sharing the gospel. And then we, then we, don't, then we, then we wonder why so many believers are, 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 are at home or don't come to church or have fallen away because of the fact that we as other believers have not considered how our conversation, either directly or indirectly, is affecting them. If my conversation is to be redemptive, then I need to take my junk that people throw on me, not to them, but to God. Can, can I let you in on an insight, an, an insight secret as a pastor? I get talked about a lot. I get criticized a lot. I get told off a lot, but not to my face. I'm not just letting you in on it. I do, I do, I do. Some folks come tell me what they done said. To, and then the same people that say that or talk about, make an appointment to see me, want my help. And I know what they said about me. I know how they feel about me. Some of y'all. I know what y'all say about me around your dinner table, because somebody from your dinner table come tell me. They do, they, they, they do. Hey, I'm, I'm giving you inside seats. And listen, I trust that any of you that have come to me or any of those that have come to me for help didn't even know I knew. Because when you get done talking about me and I hear about it, I go to my knees and I put it at my father's feet. Because I see, because I, because I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know that there's going to come a situation that God's going to create it that you're going to have to come to me. And I can't let what you said about me hinder God from using me or blessing you the way he wants to bless you through me. And, and, and listen, and I, and I say that to you because not because I can do that because I'm a pastor. That, that ain't the reason I can do that. I do that because I'm committed to my relationship with the Lord. Ain't got nothing to do with my title. It has to do with my relationship with God. I want to honor him. Because even if I wasn't a pastor, I still do the same thing. Because I don't want you, as I said it before, to steal my well done. Listen, too many of us in here are allowing people to steal your well done. You acting like they acting because they done treated you a certain way. And you think God not going to deal with you acting the same way they acting? He just. Fair, he going to deal with sin. Whether you justify yours or not, he going to deal with it. Consequence the same. And listen, I don't want 
want you to make me get some negative consequences because I'm acting toward you the way you act toward me. I ain't doing it. Old songs say, talk about me as much as you please. The more you talk, I'm going to stay on my knees. And as I'm on my knees, God deals with me, deals with my heart, gives me the strength to be able to love you, to be able to minister to you, and to be able to be what God wants me to be. For you. And listen, that's what God wants each to do for each and every one of us as we interact with each and every one of us. My conversation in encouraging ought to show my compassion. My conversation, I got to move on, in encouraging ought to show my concern. He says, seasoned with salt. You hear that? Seasoned with salt. Seasoned. He say dump salt on it. <laughs> hey, dump salt on your food and see if you eat it. When you want, when you want to do something with salt with your food, you sprinkle it because you season it just to get it taste the way you want it to taste because you seasoning it. You ain't dumping salt on it because you want it right so it can be palatable to you, so it can be pleasing to you, so you can enjoy the meal. God said your conversation ought to be seasoned. You just can't say what you want to say when you want to say it. I don't care who it is. From your spouse to your children to your to the people who live to the people who live, you just you you don't dump salt on stuff. Dumping salt on stuff don't make it taste good. Dumping salt on stuff don't make it pleasing. You dump some salt on it, I ain't gonna eat it. <laughs> Too much salt makes it unpleasing. Just enough salt. Makes it fine. Matter of fact, salt has three properties. Salt purifies, salt seasons, and salt preserves. So therefore, in my conversation, I need to make sure my motives are pure as I talk to you and as I speak to you, that it shows forth my concern for you in terms of my desire to want to edify you and bless you. It is also preserving. It is also seasoning that I use the words that are necessary that will edify and And listen, even when I want to correct you, even when I want to critique you, even when I need to tell you something wrong in your life or you need to correct something in your life, I don't dump salt on it. I season it. I get the right words. I ask God to help me with how to say it. I ask God to make me say it in a way that even though it may bother you a little bit, you'll know my motive behind it. It's not because I hate you, because I'm concerned about you. And I care about where God is taking you and what you're going to become. Season those words. Listen, sometimes we need to pray before we talk, and then I pray after we talk. Too many of us end up praying after we talk. Oh, God, oh, it's just way worse than I, oh, I wish I never said that. You should always pray before you talk. Prayer is a good seasoning for your conversation. Prayer and prayer help you know how to say what you need to say before you say it. Prayer can tell you not to say it if you don't need to. God said, you know, you, this is what you say that, you know what's going to happen. And then it's salt is preserving. Listen, my words are to preserve and encourage your faith. I don't care who you are or where, as long as we're a part of the body of believers and we are pre Christians who interact with one another, my words to you ought to be such that they preserve and strengthen your faith and encourage your relationship with the Lord. Not cause you. To doubt, not cause you to turn, not cause you to want to reject, reject this faith because of the way they were talked to or the way they were treated. You know, they didn't, God ain't going to accept the excuse, but there are too many folks who don't come to church because of somebody else. I'm not saying the excuse is tautable or reasonable. It, 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 it may have justification behind it, but it shouldn't keep you from coming to church. God's going to deal with the one who ran you away, but if you run away because of him, he's going to deal with you too. Oh, 
So if I'm going to talk to you in an encouraging way, you need to know that I'm concerned about you. Even when I got to talk, when I need to bring up critiques, when I bring up things that are wrong, it ought to be seasoned with the love that God has given me for you. So you know that even in my correction and in my criticism and in my critique, the motivation is love. And that's the last and final thing I need to share with you, my commitment. You ought to sense my commitment to you in my conversation. Not only my compassion, not only my concern, but my commitment. And listen, and my commitment to you is this, love. God tells me in the word that I am to love you. That's what he said. He says, he says matter of fact, the text that I wrote down here was uh, 1 John 4, 12. This is the command that we have from God, that he who loves God must love his brother also. I can't claim I love God if I don't love you. And so the, the, what motivates my compassion, what motivates my concern is that my commitment to you is that I love you. The Bible says that the world will know that you are my disciples by your love one for another. It didn't say by your love for me. Did you kiss that? The text in the text that Jesus said, this is Jesus talking. He didn't say the world's going to know you my disciples by your love for me. He said, they're going to know you, my disciples, by your love for each other. That's how they're going to know you belong to me, is by the way you love each other. And a part of the way I love you is also by the way I talk to you. Not just the way I treat you, but also the way I communicate through my conversation, my compassion, my concern, and my commitment. See, listen. I don't know if you've ever thought about your conversation before today, apart from the gospel. But I need you to understand that the Holy Spirit is trying to help us understand is that God is not only judging me for who I tell about Jesus, but, not only, but, all, but also how I talk about them about Jesus and how I talk to them after they know Jesus. <laughs> Amen. That if you leave my, my presence in a conversation and don't feel encouraged and edified, then I'm not focused in my conversation on what I need to be focused on. The conversation is important. If I'm going to be the laborer that God calls me to be, if I'm going to be the disciple that God wants me to be, if I'm going to be used by God in a way that's going to bring glory to his name, bring blessings into my life, and cause others to become to know him, it, I, need to not, I need to consider my conversation in the engaging aspect of it as well as in the encouraging aspect of it. So, what you going to do with how you talk? I mean, you may have said something this week that offended somebody, and you may have felt justified in saying it. But maybe today you just heard that your justification wasn't good enough. You may need to go back and ask for forgiveness. You may need to go back and repent. You may, may need to go back and take that back. Tell them, you know something? I, what I said to you was not godly. And would, would it not represent the God I love nor the God I serve? And so I ask you to forgive me for that. But listen, God is the God of the second, third, and fourth chance. Listen, it ain't never too late to get it right with God. God is always ready not only to forgive, but to restore and to reconcile. We just have to be willing to submit and obey. Amen? All his bow, all eyes closed. Father, we then thank you and praise you for your word and for the challenge from your word today. As it speaks to our hearts and to our minds and to our spirits, Father, we know we can look at ourselves and ask you from that aspect to deal with us in a way that conforms us to your will and transforms us into the image of your dear son. So we thank you today, Father, for your word. We thank you today, Lord, for your blessings, and we thank you today for the, for the encouragement that comes from your word. And now, as we have heard, God, we pray that we'll not just be hearers, but we will be doers. And at this point of doing, there are some decisions that some of us need to make today. In terms of the engagement conversation, we need to examine ourselves to see if our confession for you is not word only, but it's also deep. 
that if we truly have accepted you and made you the Lord of our lives. It might be today that you that's the first time you've heard that you need to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. You probably thought that to get to know the Lord was just all that was required was coming to church. But there's something that you have to do on your part. And that part is confessing God. Confessing him to the degree that you are willing to make a life change. Confessing him to the degree that you're willing to make a moral change. To believe and to transform your way into his way and cause his way to become your way. And listen, and if that's what you need to do this morning, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. We, we are we're here to stand with you. We're here to hold your arms up. We're here to encourage you in that. God wants you to be a part of his family. God wants you to be in relationship with him. God died. He died on the cross and rose from the grave, which is what Easter is all about, so that you could have a relationship with him that will take you from earth to heaven. And the only thing he requires of you to have that relationship is that you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And listen, and we're, we're ready, we're able, we're willing to take you through that process so that you'll know exactly for sure that when you've done it, he is, you are in his, he's in your life and you are a part of his family. And then there are for some of us who are believers that we've been challenged and convicted by our conversation and we need to repent. Just simply need to ask God to forgive us. We simply need to surrender. There are some areas in our lives, and I don't know what they may be, but God does. And it's that the Spirit is speaking to my spirit, telling you that it's, it takes a step of repentance on your part to turn from that. It takes an acknowledgement in your mind and in your spirit that you're in the wrong place and, that, and an acknowledgement that you need to want to be in the right place so God and you can begin to move and transition you to where you need to be. And that might require for you today just to simply come and stand or kneel at the altar and surrender it to him. If, yeah, the hurt may be justifiable. The reason that the people are causing you to act this way may be, you may have every reason in the world to do that, but you're not honoring God. You're not reflecting his character. You're not being who he wants you to be, not only just in their lives, but in the lives of others. And you may not even realize that you're affecting other people's walk because of the way you're responding to the circumstance or situation in your own life. It's not your intent. You just hurt. It's not your not your 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 motive. You just don't you just feel that it's the right thing to do because it, it, it's, it's what's happening to you. But you've heard God tell you today that's not where he wants you to stand. It's not where he stands. It's not how he re reacts. It's not how he wants you to react. So you want to you need to repent. You need to surrender. You need to trust him that if you'll do it his way, he'll give you the power and he'll give you the anointing. So, Father, I thank you right now for these decisions that, these, that you are leading each and every one of us to make. And, Lord, in the public ones that need to be made, let us not be afraid nor ashamed to recognize them and own them and do what we need to do to let you know that we repent of them, that we turn from them, and we desire your will above all else. Bless each and every one we pray now in their decisions. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand? And as we stand, you've heard what I've said about those decisions. You know if you need to come. And listen, and here's how you know. The Spirit of God is speaking to your heart, telling you to come. come on. He's telling you to come. And if he is, come. If he is, come. If he's telling you to come, just come on. For salvation, to surrender, to repent to turn from some conduct or actions or things that you know God doesn't want you to do. Come. Come. Tell God you love him. Tell God you're committed to him. Tell God you want his will above all else. But come. The Spirit is speaking to you. Here's your opportunity to obey. You may pass. How do I know, Pastor? Well, there's a voice in your head saying, go. There's a voice in your head saying, do that. There's a voice in your head saying, this is what I want you to do. That's the Spirit of God speaking to you. Obey Him. You won't regret it. It's going to be a blessing for you. Obey Him. That voice yelling at you, telling you to stay, that's the enemy trying to steal your blessing. God blesses obedience. God blesses obedience. Amen. We're going to pray for these who have come, and even as we pray for them, 
sense the Spirit of God telling you to come? Come even as we pray. Father, we thank you today. Thank you again for your word. And most of all, thank you for these who have not only heard you, but they have obeyed you. They have come to receive what you have brought them here to receive. They've come to allow you to transform and change their lives. They've come to begin to walk in the pattern of your will in order that they might be fulfill their destiny and fulfill their purpose. God, we thank you today for what you have done to navigate the circumstances of their lives, to bring them to face to face with you in order that they might know you for yourself, for themselves. So we thank you for them right now. And we pray your blessings upon them as they spend time with the ministers and the connectors who will talk with them and pray with them. God, we pray that you would grant men and these men and women the wisdom and discernment so that their words who are spoken to these who have come will only give them the confirmation that what they've done today is your will for their lives. Bless them now, we pray, and help them grow and help them begin to develop in their relationship with you and help us be what we need to be for them so that they can become everything that you've ordained them to be. Bless them now, we pray, and thank you for their decisions in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Minister Ron, right here, would you follow him, please? He and the connectors are going to talk to you for a few brief moments about the decision that you've made. Come on, just follow. Come on, Ecclesia, encourage them. Encourage them. Encourage them as they go. If you want church membership, whatever, go with Brother Ron. He will make sure you have that this morning. Amen. Come on, encourage them some more. You may be seated. We have special treats today. We got baptism today. Hallelujah. We decided that we were going to do a very special baptism on, on Palm Sunday only because of the request of a particular family. But as we listened to their request, we were led by the Spirit to send out an email, an invitation to anybody else who wanted to be baptized this morning. So this morning, we have five individuals who are going to be baptized today. Amen. Two of which are from the same family. Two of which are two, four. How I put this? Two or four are from the same family. Matter of fact, two are from one particular family, two are from another, but this family is about to be combined into one family. Amen. So you got the, the sons of the fiance and the and the and the groom and his brother being getting baptized today. And then you have one of our own members, senior mother, being baptized today. Amen. Bible teaches us that baptism is a sign of an outward conversion, that we, when we are baptized, we are buried with Christ in baptism, and then we're resurrected anew from the water in relationship with him. It's not about salvation, but it is about the, about the witness to the fact that you are saved. So today, Minister Harvey Haynes is going to be leading us in our baptismal service today. Hallelujah. Praise God, saints. Wonderful to be alive in Jesus. Hallelujah. Like Pastor said, we're bringing five souls to the water this morning. And this is Palm Sunday. I am reminded that this is the Sunday that we celebrate Jesus coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey amidst the praises of the people. But oh, in just a few days, he was going to give his life a ransom for many. You know, one of the last things he said when he hung on the cross was it's finished. Jesus finished the work required to bring us into a relationship with the Father. Amen. And then three days later, he got up from the, from the grave and he said, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. Go make disciples. This is part of the process of making disciples. And to those of you who have family and friends that are being baptized, we invite you to have a ringside seat. Amen. We want to remember this. We want to cherish this. We want to always keep this before our family and our friends. Amen. As we usher people into the kingdom of God. I'm reminded of an old song that says, Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where from cleansing from sin.
bringing brothers and sisters to the Lord. Hallelujah. I just get excited about obedience. This is Isaac. Amen. Brother Isaac, how are you? Are you? Is there anything you'd like to share with the family? Yeah, I have some words. I'm all on my way. singing at midnight, singing prayers to God, and the prisoners were listening. Sometimes when we sing our praises to God, there are others that are hearing our praise, and a blessing is about to come. The Bible says that at about midnight, there was a great earthquake, so that everyone's bands were loosed. Your praise don't go for not only just for you, but everyone's bands were loosed. But there was a certain jailer who seen all the doors open and fearing that everyone had escaped, he ran in and pulled his sword. He was about to kill himself. And he heard Paul say, do yourself no harm because we're all here. He ran in trembling called for a light and said what must I do to be saved the response is the same believe on the Lord Jesus and you can be saved you and your whole household after they preached to the household you know he was saved he was baptized and his entire household young man you're about to embark on a journey that only the direction of the Lord is going to bring you safely to the other side. You have an impact on your whole family. That's a big responsibility, but we serve a big God. Do you believe that Jesus Christ
Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died on the cross to save you from your sins? Yes. Do you believe that he's coming back for you and your whole household? Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Then in obedience to his great command, I now baptize you, my brother, on the profession of your faith. In the name of the Father, that's God. <laughs> In the name of the Son, that's Jesus. And of the Holy Ghost. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap. Everybody stand. <laughs> Touch hands with somebody close to you as we prepare to dismiss and go home. Next Sunday is Easter, a resurrection celebration of our Lord and Savior. This Friday is Good Friday service. Come and join us as we worship the Lord in both this coming week. Amen. Father, we thank you and praise you for the blessed privilege you've given us to worship together today. Thank you for what you have done, encouraging our hearts, our minds, and our spirits. Thank you, Father, for giving us exactly what you know we need in order that we can make continue to stand and be the light and salt in the world that you've called us to be. Now, Father, as we leave this place, we are mindful that we do not leave your presence. We depart in your presence to serve. Let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And above all, Lord, cause us not just to be hearers of your word, but doers also. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Hug somebody before you leave this place today.